coming up tonight on primetime local news. The annual Terry Fox run that takes place in the border city. And we check out the men's wrestlers basketball team. Plus the Native Friendship Center gears up for Truth and Reconciliation Day. Prime Time Local News, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. Hello and welcome to Prime Time Local News. My name is Thomas Wildman and thank you for joining us. College Park School held their annual Terry Fox run today and our Nicholas Hot has more on the event. Today the students of College Park took the time to walk and run in honor of Terry Fox and the fight against cancer is getting out an important message to fight against cancer. And it's an important, uh, teaches important skills like determination and courage and just helping fight for each other. Terry Fox was an inspiration to many around the world. Today, schools still commemorate his legacy by taking the time to run. Uh, I think he was a, a really big influence. Um, a lot of the kids can identify with him and he encourages so many people to, to never give up. Every year kids experience what Terry Fox went through and how much we can learn from him and his actions. Uh, the fact that he keeps saying never give up, uh, he had courage, right, and the, how far he went and still never gave up, only through pain he quit, right, so it's teaching the kids that they can be resilient and they can get through things. Nicholas Hot, Primetime, Local News. This Monday is Truth and Reconciliation Day, and to commemorate the important day, the Lloydminster Native Friendship Centre is putting on a walk. The event starts at 10 a.m. with the TP being set up at City Hall. The walk will start at 1 p.m. following the setup of the TP. We're going to actually start the walk right from City Hall. So we'll have an opening prayer. We'll walk around this big civic square and then back to the front of City Hall or the east side of City Hall to uh, have a small program. We have some speaker, a couple speakers and dancers, and uh, we end with a little round dance where everybody can participate. The purpose of the day, as well as the walk, is to honor the memories of Indigenous people lost to residential schools, as well as tell the stories of those who survived and work towards a more united Canada. People can show solidarity with the Indigenous community by wearing orange. We encourage everybody to, to wear orange that day. If you have an orange shirt or uh, anything orange, wear it that day and please come join us. We'll have some uh, cookies and water and juice and uh, we just welcome you to bring your family or, or your coworkers and come join us. It, it's only an hour or two out of your time and it's such an important day. Everyone is welcome to come and join the walk on Monday and learn about the things they can do to help move forward with truth and reconciliation. A Truth and Reconciliation event is planned for Weaver Park this weekend, and Cheers Live is bringing Yuck Yucks back to the city. Heather Klagas has more in this week's edition of What's Happening. Coming up this weekend, you and your family are invited to Weaver Heritage Park to take part in Cultural Connections, a Truth and Reconciliation learning experience. Activities are going to run Sunday, September 29th and Monday, September the 30th. And it's an opportunity for you and your family to listen to elders and knowledge keepers and also to take part in games and activities. There's going to be an opportunity to make a dream catcher, to find out how Bannock is made. There's also going to be a chance to learn about TP teachings, to learn how to jake. Tasha Hilderman will also be doing readings of her book, Métis Like Me. And there's going to be an opportunity as well for you and your family to take part in the Community Art Project. That will be located in the log cabin here at Weaver Heritage Park. If you'd like to get more details, you can get in touch with the Lloydminster Museum and Archives. They hope that you can join them this weekend right here at Weaver Heritage Park. You have an opportunity to laugh this weekend. Yuck Yucks is making a stop in Lloydminster at Cheers Live coming up tomorrow night and the headliner for this show is Lloydminster's own Charles Haycock. You may have seen him on TV on the Winnipeg Comedy Festival or the Halifax Comedy Festival. He's also performed at the Sudbury Comedy Festival, the Kamloops Comedy Festival and more. He's headlining the show, also a part of the show Anton Mashishin and the MC for the evening is Lori Ferguson Ford. She's got over 20 years experience in stand-up 
stand-up comedy. A night of laughter awaits you. Yuck Yucks Cheers Live coming up tomorrow night. For all the details and to get your ticket, you can head online eventbrite.ca. You can enjoy some great live music and some dancing tomorrow. Polka Fest is taking place at the Dewberry Hall. It gets underway at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. They'll serve supper at 6 and then you can dance until 11 p.m. Some tickets will be available at the door. It is a fundraiser for the Dewberry Hall. Well, whatever you choose to do this weekend, we hope you stay safe and stay healthy. What's Happening is brought to you by Northern Factory Workwear, Circle Drive East, Saskatoon, and Highway 17 South, Lloydminster. And we'll have more primetime local news after the break. Welcome back. A run for Lloyd Minster is planned to raise funds for Border City Connects. Put on through the Amadiyya Muslim Andalaria Association, a run for Lloyd is planned next week at Bud Miller Park. So here in Lloyd Minster, uh, run for Lloyd Minster is again, uh, we will be helping a local community, local charities. All the funds that we will raise are going to remain in the local community and to get the benefit for uh, local community and people around here. The Muslim Association is proud to be able to support such an important organization. So this year's uh, Run for Lloyd Minister event is happening uh, in partnership with the Border City Connects and we are very excited and uh, it's a one of those uh, charities or one of those services that uh, most of people or a lot of people use on daily basis and get benefit from their services which they are doing uh, I, I think they are doing an amazing job it's a wonderful service that we have uh, within our community a classroom for students with mental health needs has been set up at a school in Bonneville Stacy Comer has more on why it was set up and how it is different from regular classrooms I have a special guest joining me today on Primetime Local News. Tanya Kendall is here. Tanya is the Senior Manager of Clinical Operations for CASA Mental Health. Tanya, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Well, we have a special project that we're going to be talking about today, but the first thing I want to ask is what exactly is CASA? So CASA Mental Health is a nonprofit organization and uh, we serve children aged 3 to 18 and their families. And we have been delivering care in the Edmonton area since 1988. Um, throughout the last 40 years or so, we, of course, um, have expanded from just Edmonton um, to provide service for um, northern Alberta and central Alberta. And then in the last year or so, we are expanding provincially through our delivery of CASA classrooms and expansion of our CASA house and uh, day program throughout the province. So there is a CASA classroom at HE Burgoyne School, and that's what we wanted to talk a little about today. So can you tell me what is a CASA classroom? What does that mean and, and how is it different from a regular classroom? Absolutely. So if you can think um, of a world where we have mental health services that show up where kids already are, um, there's no need for caregivers to schedule an appointment and take time off work. And that support is where the families need it, built right into their lives. That's essentially the premise of the CASA classroom. So we were really um, very much about bringing that uh, feeling and that service to where kids are at in the community. Uh, we know since um, COVID, we know it's always been there, but really since COVID it's come up um, into our faces that there's um, this need for mental health supports for kids. Um, just beyond, they might have gone to see their family doctor, they might have gone to see a community therapist, but they need that little bit of extra support, but they don't need to go to the emergency department and they don't need to be admitted into an acute care facility to deal with their mental health. They just need that little bit extra, um, what we have termed the missing middle. So um, they've gone to their family doctor, got that support, 
and they just need that little bit more. They're still struggling at home with their peers, maybe at school. And that's where we're able to come in there and provide a mental health comprehensive support right in their, in their classroom, in their school division. Have you had quite a bit of support for this classroom at H.E. Burgoyne School? Absolutely. Northern Lights School Division has been a wonderful partner so far. Uh, they um, are very innovative and recognize the need for mental health services. Um, so once there's this opportunity uh, through CASA and the government of Alberta to partner, uh, they were on board uh, pretty quick. So um, they um, provided us with um, a classroom in a school and they provided us with a, a teacher who is interested and experienced in um, mental health supports for, for kids in a learning environment. And then um, we've been able to partner and provide um, our classroom team who works right in the school, as well as our support team that works around the team here right in Bonneville. So how do the students get into this classroom? Is it like an application process or do teachers recommend them or how does it work to get the students into this, this program? So to get into the program, uh, students need to have had um, some mental health intervention previously. So as I mentioned, uh, through your family doctor, a community therapist, um, in places we've, we've identified a gap, right? We know that sometimes there's not family doctors and um, an ability to um, access private community therapy. Some schools have been really fantastic with their learning supports teams, being able to provide some interventions and identify that uh, some of these kids need a bit of extra support. So they're able to um, be identified. We have a very simple process. Um, there's just a referral. So obviously the parents need to be engaged and aware and um, they do a form and the school does a form. And if they do have a family doctor or a community therapist, there's a portion for them to fill out as well. And then essentially um, we come together and we do what's called a needs assessment to essentially see um, what services the child has already had and what services we can provide in that classroom setting. And then we really look at it from the mixed perspective. So the children have to be um, capable of participating and understanding concepts. Uh, they do a mix of academic and um, group and individual therapy. We really, really concentrate on some social emotional learning uh, so that these kids can be successful when they go back to their regular school program. And then throughout all that, our goal is that successful transition. So as soon as they start, we work really closely with their home classroom, a home teacher, home school, to really build that transition. So they might have connection visits. They might do um, Terry Fox Run, for instance, with their home classroom. If there's like Christmas concerts, we really, really want that engagement. Because at the end of the day, this is a very small focused classroom, but they're going back to a much larger classroom in a regular school. So how can we help them be successful? So if people are looking for more information on this program or are interested in possibly having this, uh, you know, in their school, because it is such a, you know, obviously such a need. Every time you see in people talking on social media, it's how can we help kids? There seems to be this gap. And this is just such a great program, Tanya. So if people are looking for more information, whether it be to get their kids involved or to have it brought to their school, where is the best place they can go to find this information or to get in touch with CASA? So they can go to our website, casamentalhealth.org. And on there, if they go to programs, they'll find CASA Classrooms. And all the information is on the website about how to contact us if you're a school division, if you want to partner, as well as more information for parents. Uh, there's the handbook on there that just gives a really great understanding, breakdown of what a school looks like from um, elementary. So we serve grades uh, four through 12. And um, generally how that works for each group of grade levels. So junior, high, high school and elementary school. Well, Tanya, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, let's chat again in the future and, and get an update on how this program is going because it's just an amazing program and what a great opportunity for kids that need the help. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. That's all for news, sports is next, but first here's a look at your closing market.
Today's oil prices are brought to you by First General Services. Lakeland Rustlers men's basketball team is looking to improve on one of their best seasons in program history. The Lakeland Rustlers men's basketball team is working hard at practice to prepare for the regular season. It's been cool. Uh, Coach Sheree and Coach K took me in under their wing and I've just been developing behind them trying to get back in shape. Um, it's been cool here getting with the guys, training with them every day, so I'm excited for the actual season and how things will turn out. The wrestlers came home with a bronze medal at the ACAC championship last year, and while they are proud of what they accomplished last season, the team has its sights set on the goal. It's always championship, that's what we always reach for the top. We don't, we don't want to settle for second place or third place. You know, last year we got third place. We don't want to settle for second place, we want it all. So Coach Shere just instilled it into us every day. We're just talking about how we can get better and what championship teams do, what kind of championship mentality we got to have to reach that level and that kind of focus so that we can, when it's time, when it's time to go, you know, we got that. Next up, the wrestlers will have five preseason games against fellow ACAC teams before the regular season tips off. Yeah, we're just going to try to find our, our, you know, team camaraderie, um, try to find the right lineups that gel with one another, um, trying to see what the, you know, newer guys can bring and trying to see if uh, the veteran players have taken a step. So uh, that's what the preseason is all about is it's, you know, learning our systems, seeing what we can do defensively, see what players stand out, um, and, and making those strides for the regular season. Thomas Wildman, Primetime, Local News. The Bee Fisher Foundation is holding their first annual pickleball tournament fundraiser as a way to kickstart their fundraising season. Abby St. John has more. The Bee Fisher Foundation is holding its first annual pickleball tournament at the beginning of October. And today I'm very happy to be joined by Kim Crockett with the Bee Fisher Foundation. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for inviting me there, Abby. Of course. Now, uh, this tournament, like I said, is coming up on October 5th, and it is a pickleball fundraising tournament for the Bee Fisher Foundation. So can we start with how the pickleball tournament came to be and how it will work on October 5th? Sure. Well, how it came to be is we've got a fantastic board of directors that uh, they're routinely just trying to think, how can we uh, just be raising the funds that we need for capital projects with the foundation? How can we better engage with the community? And it was just with that uh, collective group of thinkers around the table, the idea of a pickleball tournament came up. We've got a few people within that group that either they play themselves or they've got family members that play just thinking this is a gap in the, I guess, on the recreation the sports landscape is an actual pickleball tournament so that's what they're trying to fill that sounds amazing and it is a unique way to raise money a fun active way also to raise money and maybe even learning a new sport um, I was telling you earlier that I've never played so it's it's interesting to be able to have this kind of tournament where you may be able to try something new uh, which is exciting now this is a fundraiser for you guys so what will the money raise be going towards Sure. So we, uh, we were really fortunate. We held uh, a number of uh, New Year's Eve galas over the past number of years. And the focus on those uh, galas was to uh, take care of a number of uh, improvement projects at several of our 24-hour care homes here in Lloydminster. Now we've been able to take care of most of those more pressing needs, and we're transitioning more into our transportation need. And so what we're looking to do with the pickleball term is that's going to be the kickstart to helping us raise, we're hopeful, of over $150,000 towards the purchase of a specialized van that'll move a number of the individuals in our care, many of whom have got some sort of mobility uh, challenge. And so it's going to be basically we need to be able to move people in wheelchairs from place to place. That sounds amazing. And I know the support of the community, I have no doubt that you'll be able to raise that starting with the tournament. Um, mm -hmm. Now for registration, there is a maximum of 75 teams, I believe. Uh, how does registration work? How many people towards a team uh, can companies make a team and then join? Can sports, how, how does the whole forming a team work and the whole registration process? Yeah, so the way that we're structuring the tournament, it's uh, it's teams of two, so it's doubles teams. Uh, we can take a maximum of 72 teams. We're really close. Um, 
uh, we will mix them into, at this point, just a beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And when people register, which they can do right on our website, so bfisher.com, there's going to be a link right to the pickleball registration page and provide a number of other details on there. They can register both themselves or their uh, the first player and their playing partner, um, and they can take care of all those registration details at that point in time. The Wonderful. cost is... Yeah, the cost is $80 for team. And like you said, Abby, it's it's a fundraiser. It's helping us kickstart the fundraising for the van. Yes, for sure. And $80 is, you know, it's a great price for the tournament. And like you said, it is for a great cause. Now, for those who are beginners and have never played pickleball or but want to join, but kind of want to know what pickleball is, on the 29th, you'll be hosting a learn to play pickleball event Tell me how that works, how people can get involved, and what that kind of means. Sure. So uh, there's a couple of ways to get involved with that one. We do have just a few spots left in that. So if you do have interest, it's uh, this is a don't delay sort of moment. Um, one of the ways that you can uh, get in, or, uh, register for that is simply when you register for the tournament, you can indicate right at that time on our website you'd like to participate. The other way that you can get involved is simply give us a phone call at 780 875-3633 and just express your interest that you'd like to come and uh, come on out. So the details of that one though, uh, it's going to be this Sunday night. So September the 29th uh, at 6.30 until 8 p.m. at the Service Sports Center. Uh, a couple of our tournament organizers are going to be involved in uh, hosting just some basic uh, teaching on the game of pickleball. And it's going to be, especially for those that are new to the game, or uh, just want to need to brush up on some of the rules and techniques, this is the time to come. Bring your own equipment, uh, $20 cash at the door, and I think it's going to be a great time. Yes, that sounds amazing. And it's just a great way to get into the spirit of the tournament. And like I said earlier, learn something new maybe, which is so, which is awesome. And it kind of gets people loosened up for the actual tournament as well. So uh, thank you so much for joining me. I'm sure that this is a great, unique way to kickstart your fundraising season kind of. Um, so I wish you the best of luck for this tournament. And thanks again for joining me. Thank you so much, Abby. If I could mention just two other things about the tournament. Uh, one is we know how much we appreciate home cooking in this town. And so uh, up in the OTS room during the course of the tournament, uh, there's going to be uh, some homemade food up there for sale by donation. So that'll be available. And the second thing, we don't put on tournaments like this without uh, amazing community support. And I really want to give a shout out to the TD Bank. Uh, they are our title sponsor for the event. And so really thanks to them for uh, giving us the opportunity to put this on to begin with. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. This week's weather has been warm, but last week was cold and wet. According to the province's latest crop report, heavy rains continue to delay harvest for Saskatchewan producers. CTV's Sarah D'Souza Butts has an update from the field. Sun, rain, what determines the outcome of a good crop? Usually the later the rains, the, the less they affect the, the yield. It's sort of set in stone already, uh, you know, in, in August. Despite the rainfall received in September, farmers across Saskatchewan say crops are sitting at average quality. The general consensus around here, talking to neighbours and, and, and friends, they say uh, uh, they're, you know, same thing. It looked better than, than what they actually got out of it, but uh, on average, I would say. According to the province's recent crop report, 96% of harvest is complete in the southwest, 83% in the southeast. Following are the east central and west central regions sitting at 70 and 75%, leaving the northeast and northwest regions both at 65% of completion. There's other pockets that have struggled a little bit this year with the drier weather, but so we'll see what the report looks like, you know, at the end of harvest when the other 20% of us get finished up here and we'll you know, I think we'll have an average crop in the province. The province also reports that three of Saskatchewan's agri-food commodities have already surpassed $1 billion in exports this year. Wheat exports are at $1.7 billion, canola seed $1.3 billion, and canola oil is just over $1 billion. However, Boxwell points out that the current grain terminal workers' strike continues to impact producers on those exports. This is the Canadian economy we're talking about. There needs to be a sense of urgency by everyone involved to get this rectified and come up with a deal that works for both the union and the 
terminals and, and get everyone back to work to get our products moving. With harvest almost reaching an end, farmers say they hope to finish combining by the time Thanksgiving comes. Sierra D'Souza Butts, CTV News, Yorkton. And now we'll take a look at your adorable pets with our pet picks of the day. We want to see your pets. Send photos of your pet and their name to have them featured on Pet of the Day. 